You know, as we're in this vision uh, series, we're not just wanting to talk about vision and different values around church so that you just get it mentally, because oftentimes people receive messages in a mental way. What we want is not just something that hits your head, but something that hits your heart, because this is who we are. We, we're speaking from a reality that we live in. One of the problems I've seen in the Western church over and over again is the fact that we idolize the intellect so much. And a lot of our great preachers and the things we look at, as, oh yeah, that was an amazing uh, teaching, oftentimes we judge it based on how intellectually satisfying it is. And I'm not trying to say God, is, God doesn't want to expand our intellect because actually he said we should love the Lord with all our mind. So there's nothing wrong with that. But there is a danger, and I've seen this repeat itself over and over again, where in the West, we become theologically astute and spiritually inept. So we can explain things so well, theologically, explain scriptures, texts, break it down, but we lack spiritual intelligence. You know, you can have emotional, emotional intelligence, and you can have IQ, and you know, different people have different levels of IQ. Now, there's something else you don't think about, spiritual intelligence, which is your ability to discern God and your ability to function as a priest, understanding the laws of the Spirit, understanding what it is to sacrifice, understanding how to lay hold of God and cause impact in the natural through spiritual laws. See, that is an aspect of our faith in the Western church I feel is really lacking. And God is really wanting to educate us, not just so our head gets bigger and we fill our heads with information, but so that our hearts expand and we live from the inside out. It's not just filling our heads with information. It's about living from the inside out. Now, there are many preachers in the room, there are many of you here who have been Christians for a long time, and you've read through different parts of the Bible. And I don't know if you're like me, sometimes you read a scripture, and as you read a scripture, you're like, oh, I think I know this one. Can I just say to you again, you don't know anything. I don't mean to be rude, but I think that to myself as well. There are scriptures I've preached many times. I look at it, and I'm aware that I've preached this before, but I still know that I don't know it yet. Because the scriptures is like, it's like a diamond. Like There are so many facets to it. You may have a revelation of one part of, one part of it, but until the Lord opens your heart to a whole new realm, you're still stuck where you are. So there's so much more. That's what I'm trying to say. There is so much more in God. And it's not intellectual. That's part of it. It's more experiential in encounter. He wants us to be changed from the inside out. He's in the, biz- he's in the business of changing, reforming us in our hearts. Was it not Paul that said, my little children whom I travail until Christ is formed in you? formed in you. That's a process, formation. When that happens in you, the secondary consequence is your actions begin to change. Your priorities begin to change. And I'm saying all that to say, we don't just want to talk about ideas and values and give you concepts. We want to talk about who we are as a church. This means a lot to us. Now, the word consecration, you hear that thrown around every so often. If you're a new Christian, you might be like, what on earth is that? If you've been a Christian for a while, you probably have an idea, but you might not be able to Maybe you might be able to explain it. Maybe you might not be able to explain it. And my goal is not to try to get you to be able to explain it. My goal is to try to get you to see what God is speaking to us as a church about who we are so that you begin to adopt this as your lifestyle. Many people think giving their lives to Jesus is just a one-time thing you do. Jesus, I receive you into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. Amen. And that's the end. Actually, that's the beginning. And you don't choose Jesus once, you keep choosing him every day. It's not just a one-time decision you make. Now, the degree to which you can manifest Jesus in the earth is the degree to which you're submitted and consecrated to him. So when we say consecration, you cannot understand consecration without understanding separation. To consecrate, you have to separate. In a marriage relationship, as a husband, as a wife, you are consecrated to your spouse. What that means is you're separated from all others, and now you're joined to your spouse. Your separation from all others qualifies you for deeper levels of intimacy in God's eyes. 
So any kind of intimacy you have without that commitment and that connection that you make on the wedding day, any kind of intimacy you have so that is illegal as far as God's concerned. Because what qualifies you for deeper realms of intimacy is your separation from. But the whole idea is not about just separating from, it's about being separated to. Because some people focus on just disconnection. You know, there's some people that are not Christians that are more moral than some Christians. Morality is not the same as holiness. Morality is based on activities and, you know, I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do that. That is okay. But holiness is based on something happening on the inside. It's based on a formation, the Holy Spirit, the life of God on the inside of you. And that relationship now affects your actions. Morality is outside in. Holiness is inside. And by the way, holiness and consecration are kind of similar words. Because to be holy is to be set apart. To be consecrated is to be set apart from, to be connected to. Now, this is a very important value for us here at Ram Church. We're not just into let's just get together and have a nice time and let's just sing a few songs. Let's just lift our hands and let's just say a few Christian words. We are concerned about being people who are reflecting the image of God everywhere we go and everything we do, in everything we do. Because, you see, coming to church like this, you can fall into a religious motion, you can fall into a, a pattern and Christianese and get into the mode of just doing things and you look good on the outside while you're rotten on the inside. And we're not just concerned about things looking good on the outside, we want God to change us on the inside. And if that's the case, then consecration, being set apart, holiness is going to be critical for every one of us. As you journey in God, he starts to challenge you about things in you he wants to shift, things in you he wants to change, to make you more into his image. Consecration is critical. Everyone say consecration is critical. Yes, yes, yes. So Mark 1, 9, let's look at Mark 1, 9. It says, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw heavens parting and the spirit descended upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven uh, saying, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately, everyone say immediately. Immediately. Yeah, immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. My emphasis in that reading is going to be on the part where it says, immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. Jesus is having a significant moment of encounter. The Father speaks to him in such a spectacular, powerful way and says, Jesus, you are my beloved son. Powerful moment. Um, On the back of that, the Holy Spirit drives Jesus immediately into the most difficult season of his life, which is going without food for 40 days. Anyone here has been without food for 40 days before? Have you ever met people who like to talk a lot? That they just talk and talk and talk. I don't know if you know such people, but I know a few people like that. You get on the phone with them, and uh, you just want to wrap it up quick. <laughs> and it's like, just go, it's like, okay, my communication style is I like to get straight to the point. I summarize everything, get everything into the, you know, Capsules of wisdom. Just get it all into, tell me. Have you seen that Matrix thing where the lady kind of knew how to fly the helicopter in one moment? It was just like a download of information. And all of a sudden, she could fly the helicopter. I'm like, I'm like, Lord, just quick, just, just download the information in the simplest, quickest way possible. I don't like all the fluff. Okay, just straight to the point. So, you know, every now and again, I, you know, I'm people that like to talk a lot. And what I'm trying to say is, those people, if you put them on a seven-day drive fast, when I say drive fast, in case you don't know what that is, no food and no water. Uh, you might be like, oh, okay, let's just do three days. Three days drive fast, no food, no water. If you like to talk a lot. I guarantee you by the end of the third day, 
Even if you are the most extroverted person on the planet, by the end of the third, if I were to come and try to strike a conversation with you, you know what's going to happen? The energy to talk is going to be zapped out, and you're, you're going to be as, as weak as anything can be, because whatever is feeding that desire to talk is in your flesh. And now you've gone through a process where the flesh is being slain through starving if he wants food. And Jesus went through a time where his flesh was being disciplined. He was starving his flesh. You know why? Because what your flesh is to the devil, your spirit is to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Think about that. What your spirit is to the Holy Ghost, your flesh is to the devil. So the problem is not oftentimes just the devil. It's actually learning how to bring our flesh into subjection. So Jesus himself had to bring his flesh into subjection by no food for 40 days. Now, if you read the passage carefully, he said immediately after the incredible encounter, it was immediately the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, drove him. So it wasn't Jesus doing it himself. There was another influence on Jesus that was causing him to do something his flesh may not have wanted to do. Do you know God to the degree that he can influence you to do things you don't want to do? Or do you only know God to the degree where you only do the things that you know he wants to do that makes you feel good? Because as you grow in God, your will and his will will clash a lot. But if you're in the business of only having your way and doing what you want, even when you know what he wants, you are not consecrated to him. You may have started the process of building relationship, but you are not fully consecrated to him. It says immediately the spirit drove him. What is driving you? The Holy Ghost drove Jesus. You know, your flesh can drive you. You know, ambition can drive you. You know, competition, jealousy can drive you. The world can drive you. Satan can drive you. My question is, what is driving you? Because what drives you, you actually end up giving yourself fully to. It, it takes control. Spirit beings are jealous beings. Not just God, even the devil. When the devil starts to lay hold of a family or individual, he wants to have all of you. And in fact, some of you in this room are dealing with demonic influences, not because of so much what, you d- what you've done, but because of what people in your family, your parents, your grandparents did. Because they made alliances with demonic spirits. You weren't there when they did that, but now you're here and those spirits are still trying to lay claim and influence on your life. And you're having all these negative experiences because of what someone else did? I, I, are, we, are we going too deep already? Is this okay? Is it okay for Sunday morning? Sunday evening. (laughs) So those spirit beings, they're jealous beings because some covenants were made, some agreements were made, and it implicated you. Free, oh gosh, I'm I'm going too deep. People get involved in, you know, Freemasons. The higher they go, the deeper covenants they enter into, and the more significant the impact on their bloodline. So yeah, you can say, well, you know, I'm a a new creation in Christ, all things are passed away. That is true. There's a spiritual reality you've entered into, but the spiritual realm is also a legal realm. So the devil would often look for legal grounds on which he can bring an accusation and an attack. And because someone in authority, gosh, I'm thinking, why am I going here today? I didn't plan to go here. Because someone in authority in your family, like a father, like a mother, like a grandparent, someone who has authority, because that's, an, that's a position of authority, whether they're Christian or not, because they've made certain alliances and agreements, the spirit beings responsible for those covenants are jealous. So they would seek to enforce whatever agreements were made there, down the line, until another believer arises and says, not on my watch. Until someone arises and begins to renounce that thing and break it, 
and denounce it, it will keep having impact in the family, even though they're Christians there. You have to be conscious. What I'm trying to show you is spirit beings are jealous beings, and once they make connection, they want to take ownership. The Holy Ghost does not just want a part of you. He wants all of you. He wants to drive you. He's not going to drive you if you don't give him What's the, isn't that a famous song, Give Jesus the Will? Jesus take the will or something. <laughs> Many of you have Jesus in the car, boys, in the back seat. You're in the driver's seat. You're just wanting him to give you insights and, you know, make you feel comfortable. But he wants to take the driver's seat. For that to happen, you have to enter into consecration. In other words, you're saying, Jesus, I'm giving myself to you wholly. As you enter into consecration, something you're going to start to realize is there is a basic level of commitment or let's say consecration that's required for every believer. So holiness, staying away from sin, living a life that's pleasing to the Holy Spirit, that is just basic for every believer. Not, you know, not sleeping around, not, not, not being drunk, you know, uh, uh, pornography, morality, Name them. It's the works of the flesh. It's all there in Scripture. They're things that we should stay away from. Um, and our ability, by the way, our ability to stay away from those things is not generated in our flesh. It's generated in our spirit. Because the Holy Spirit within you, the more you give room for the Holy Spirit, the more you're able to resist the works of the flesh. You cannot resist the works of the flesh if you're not giving more room to the Holy Spirit in your life. You know the illustration. It's been used several times, but it's worth using it here again. You know, if you have two dogs and you feed one all the time and you don't feed the other one and they both end up in a fight, the one you feed is obviously going to win. So what you feed grows and what you starve dies. The more you fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the more you give him room, the more you are giving yourself to him the more he can manifest himself through you, the more you can silence the works of the flesh. Now, that is just the basic. As you start to grow in God, and you start to have a revelation of what he's called you to, there will become specific consecrations he puts on you. There are things that you will know that God is calling you to stay away from so that he can drive you better. Worship leader, you cannot just sing any song. If you know God's called you on this platform, your mouth is your weapon. Preachers, if God called you to speak for him, your mouth is your weapon. So your mouth has to be consecrated to God. So you can't sing, you can't just sing anything. You can't just be using bad language, swearing. Talk. You'll be surprised at how many Christians just talk in loose mouth. In church, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Our church, all sort of filthy language. Your mouth is not consecrated. And now you come here, you grab the mic, you sing, and you expect the Holy Spirit to move? You've already surrendered your mouth to another spirit. And now you want Holy Spirit to have it. Because he's a jealous man, he's not going to share himself. Are you with? He, wants, he, he wants your mouth holy. As in, he wants all of it. He wants you to give him your whole self. And so, as you grow in God, the times when he starts to call you to lay aside certain things... Not just for the purpose of being holier than other people, but for the purpose of drawing nearer to him so that he can truly drive you, just like Jesus was driven by the Holy Ghost. Some time ago, you know, we live in within show, not just this area right here. And within show doesn't have the best reputation. <laughs> uh, so uh, our son Justice, I forgot how old he was, maybe it was eight or something. Uh, he always likes to go outside to play, and we don't always like him going out to play. But he came and said, oh, Dad, I want to go out to play. I'm like, great. He went out to play, and he came back home, and he was using the F word. <laughs> now, 
In our house, we don't swear. We never use, we've never. It's not even a part of anything we do at home. It's just, you know, we, we don't talk that way. So, um, you know, we're like, you know, where did you learn that from? And he was like, well, this person called me this, and so I called them this as well, you know. And um, I'm like, well, Justice, we don't talk that way here. Um, the fact that you're talking that way tells me that you're being influenced by those guys. So it tells me you're not mature enough to be with them. Because when you get with them, they're now corrupting your tongue. So we need to pull you away from spending time with them until we can see that you're mature enough in yourself to not be influenced by the way they're behaving. So one Sunday, when church, we came back home, and as we're parking the car, his friends from the neighborhood are shouting, Justice, come and play with us. He shouts back, I am not mature enough. <laughs> Listen, some of you are not mature enough for certain environments, and you need to be able to shout back, I am not mature enough. I am not meant to be in this place right now. Because the Lord is still working on me and I still got areas of weaknesses. When I get into this environment, they are making me talk a certain way. They are making me feel a certain way. They are making me sing certain things. I am not mature enough for that environment. So you know what you need to do? You need to pull away. It's a simple. You need to know when to stand. You need to know when to sit. You need to know when to run. There are times when you need to run away from certain things. Because you want to guard your relationship with God. Somebody else looking at you go, well, you're, you're being legalistic. You know, it's okay. The grace of God. I always say this. Any teaching on the grace of God that gives you liberty for carnality is heresy. Amen. The grace of God does not make you look like the world. You're not called to look like the world. Talk like them. Dance like them. Dress like them. And you see, I always like to go off on this thing because I see so much on social media. Many of you are on social media, so I'm going to talk about it. And you know, there's some things I like to confront when I'm speaking, right? In all honesty, I'm a nice person when I come off the platform. <laughs> How can you tell me you're representing Christ? I go on your social media feed, and what I am singing is music that is idolizing or music that is promoting immorality. The way you dress is seductive and promoting a certain lifestyle, but in your status, you put praise the Lord. Pictures with all your boobs hanging out. But, excuse me, excuse me, what spirit are you representing? The Holy Ghost will not be comfortable with his representative displaying things of the flesh in the world while trying to name the name of Christ. Even some of our worship bands that are popular today, I go on some of their Instagram pages and I am shocked at the filth. I am shocked at the worldliness. But many of you think, oh, you know what, they're popular. Don't be deceived by followers and numbers and, and views. And think, oh, because they have views, God is okay with it. You can have all the views, but heaven is not backing it. The fact that it's popular, even in the church, does not mean it is holy and set apart to God. They may have songs and preachers may have words that sound theologically right. But spiritually, they've given themselves to another spirit. The spirit of the age, the spirit of immorality, the spirit of perversion. And if you're sensitive, you can, you can feel it from some of the things that they post. And what I'm saying is, as believers, the standard under grace is higher than many of you realize. You can't just live anyhow. So when we say consecration, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to challenge the things that you think are okay. Take it back to the Lord. Holy Spirit, is it okay that I'm dressing this way? Do you realize there's some fashion that is demonic inspired? Oh, everyone, oh, the celebrities is dressing like this. Everyone's dressing, so, you know, I'm just going to dress like, but you don't understand that. That fashion, that, that, that clothing, the whole idea was inspired to invoke lust. 
and you just go with the trend. But the Holy Spirit wants to drive you. But now you're being driven by the world. You're being driven by the ideas of man. So he's going to back up until somewhere you start to say, God, convict me of anything in me that does not please you. It's not about rules and regulations. However, as you go deep in relationship, boundaries start to become very clear. The boundaries are there to protect the integrity of the intimacy. You cannot just look at the boundary. Oh, you're, this crazy, they're all about rules and regulations. Well, you're looking that way because you've not stepped into intimacy. Uh, do you know what it is to lose the peace of the Holy Spirit? Okay, let me, because I'm talking about some hard things about holiness, let me tell you, I know what it is to be in pornography. Is this too much for a Sunday evening? I don't know how many years it's been. 13 years? I've, I've lost track. Since I looked at pornography 13 years ago. Now, as I try to remember what it was like to be in that cycle, one thing I could remember, and one thing I can remember I can't forget is, whenever I fell into looking at pornography, this, the, the sense of the grief of the Holy Spirit and the sense of the losing of my peace, honestly, it was like, I, you don't know what you have until you lose it. And when it was gone, honestly, it was, it was like hell inside. Now, it's been all these years I have not known that, but I'm saying God wants you to enjoy the reality of the, of the peace and, and the connection with him. So all these things like, I don't do pornography, not because it's just a rule, but because I want to guard this thing right here. And he's a jealous spirit. So there are things I'm not going to entertain. How can you tell me you're a Christian and you're just open to watching and doing anything? If you're truly walking with God, there are some things you can't do. Because the spirit that governs your life will not let you do it. Others may, but you may not, because you're called to a higher purpose. Should we talk about dating? <laughs> if the Holy Spirit is driving you, you know you can't just date and go out with anyone. He has an, he has an opinion about the way you spend your time, your money, your energy, everything. You just want to date someone or you want to, because I, I mix up the words, because in America it's one thing, in the UK, my wife was trying to explain to me the other day, I, I might be getting the words wrong, dating and court, or courtship, there's dating and there's courtship. You can't just start going as a boyfriend, girlfriend with just anyone, just because they go to church, they look nice and you like them. So? <laughs> Listen, you like them. Does the Holy Ghost like them for you? Have you bothered to check? Because oftentimes, listen, oftentimes you are attracted to people based on fleshly preferences. But what the Holy Spirit has for you may not always tick all your fleshly boxes. So if all you're looking at is fleshly preferences, you're going to miss what God has for you because you're just fixing your eyes on what you saw in Hollywood. But he wants to bring you a raw material that you're going to work together to become something in him. Are you hearing me today? When you're consecrated to God, it affects every decision you make. You can't just have anyone as your best friend. As you're walking with God, you check out with him who are the people you're supposed to be walking closely with. You won't believe how many people come to church, make friends in church, and those friendships become their destruction. Because they have not checked it with the Lord. Lord, is this okay? Is this what you're wanting for me? When you're consecrated to God, you're checking everything with him. Like, Lord, do you really want me to go and preach over there? Lord, do you want me to go? It's, it's about what he wants. He's, didn't you pray that, Lord? Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. That's his, his will is what's critical here in consecration. What he wants. So, let me look at Matthew 16. My time is almost going now. Matthew 16, 21. 
the backstory to this is Jesus, uh, uh, Peter's had a revelation of who Jesus is. Um, and, he said, and Jesus says to him, you're Peter and on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And all of these amazing things. So it's a really significant moment. So we come here into Matthew 16, 21. After this encounter where, Jesus, uh, where Peter had a revelation of who Jesus truly is. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Gosh, what audacity. Peter is rebuking Jesus. (laughs) Think about it. Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Listen to what Jesus says. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God. Your mind is not full of the things of God, but of the things of men. So, why do you think Peter was rebuking Jesus? This is only speculation from my perspective. I'm convinced Peter had a mindset of the Messiah that was not going to die on the cross that was going to reign, get rid of the Romans, this kind of conquering Messiah. And yes, that's going to happen. That's, that's the second coming. He had that mindset that the, sorry, yeah, the second coming. He had that mindset that the Messiah was not going to cross. He didn't have that in his kind of grid, his theology, that, that kind of, he didn't have that in his mind at all. Now, because the Messiah is going to reign in his mind, and he's one of the closest people to the Messiah, what that means for him is position. What that means for him is, even though he's giving up his fishing business, now he's connected to the most important person in the whole nation. So if that's the way he's thinking, that person now says, I'm going to die. So he's like, what do you mean you're going to die? You're far be from you that you're going to die. Then Jesus says to him, get thee behind me, Satan. Because what happened was, Peter's unsanctified ambition that had not been to the cross became a platform for Satan to speak through him. Peter had not been to a place where the Lord had dealt with his desire. And now he was going to fulfill his desire to be an important person by being connected to Jesus. But because that desire of the flesh had not been crucified, now Satan is speaking through it. How many times has Satan spoken through your fleshly desires that were never crucified? How many times has your own ambition and your own desire that you never allow Jesus to deal with, that you never brought to the cross, how many times has that become a platform for the devil to speak through you and you didn't even know the devil was speaking through you? Because your flesh is to the devil what your spirit is to the Holy Ghost. And the more you journey into consecration, the less of the influence the flesh will have over you. The more your ambitions, your desires would go to the cross and he's going to slay them. He's in the business of killing people. I hope you know that. And oftentimes when he kills you, then he resurrects you again. He resurrects a new version of you. Some people, they just want to preach. It's not that it's wrong to preach. They get saved, and they think everything is about the platform. And they, want, they, want every, they, they fall in love with the, whatever it is that comes to the platform. It's not that their desire to preach is wrong, but there's some unsanctified things that God needs to deal with in them before they get on here. But they're so eager to get on here And they have not allowed God to deal with those things. And this is what happens. Sometimes when God starts to deal with those desires, all those desires are not wrong, but they just need his dealings. When you come out on the other side of the dealing, oftentimes you don't want to step on the platform anymore. Good example is Moses. Moses 
killed the Egyptian, right? Because he, there was something in him. He felt he had to bring deliverance. But it wasn't his time. He had not matured. He had not encountered God. He tried to do it in the flesh. And then obviously he got in trouble. So he ran away. 40 years later, God comes and says, Moses, all right, now I'm sending you. You know what he says? Not me. Lord, I don't want to go. Why? 40 years of dealings killed that ambition so deep. <laughs> Even God was trying to resurrect it back. The ambition was not wrong. The problem is it had not been to the cross. And when you step into consecration, you embrace the life of the cross. He challenges you. Why do you want a YouTube account? Why do you want to post that video? Why, have, you, have you brought your desire before him, Lord? Um, why? He is wanting to check what is behind. What, what you're doing may not be wrong, but what is behind it? What is the spirit driving you? Oh, all my mates are doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this. So now what's driving you is because you want to look like everyone else? Oh, that pastor, I left that church. They said I'll never amount to anything. They released these words against me. And now you're doing something good for God, but only to prove yourself. It's not the Holy Ghost driving you. It's something else driving you. That's why you need to get into consecration and allow him to expose your desires to you, your hidden agenda to you, and let him deal with it. This thing, I wrap up, my time is up. This thing I'm doing called prayer stone right now, some years ago, way before I went to the ramp, I don't know, 2020, no, it's 2003, 2002, I started a youth group meeting. I had no idea it was going to turn into anything, but God was moving in an incredible way. People were getting filled with the Holy Spirit. We used the friend's house. Lots of people were coming. The house couldn't take care of everyone. Anyway, some incredible things were happening. All of a sudden, some persecution broke out, and... All I could see was there was no way for us to carry on doing these meetings. It was like the persecution from some of the parents was so strong that it all had to be shut down, like just gone. And so all that ended. And honestly, I didn't think much of it. But I remember my dad gave me this word, John 12, 24. Unless a grain of wheat dies, it abides in itself. But when it dies, it can bear forth much fruit. What I was doing back then was actually God's intended purpose for me, but he wanted to kill it. He wanted to kill me. So by the time he asked me to do it again, it was a resurrection, or was already there, but a lot of the hidden things that I didn't even know were in me had gone through a death process. Now that's not to say I'm not still going through that right now. Because it's not just a one-time thing. You still keep going through over and over again because he shows you things you didn't see were there and he kills that again only for him to bring more life out of death later. So God is in the business of consecration. He wants to fully drive you.